Um, I'd like to introduce a very special featured presenter that we have today. Um, what's kind of interesting is envelopes, or rather, actually it was napkin at the time. Napkins serve a very useful function in terms of developing new programs. I remember I was on the eastern shore of Maryland back in 2009 at a restaurant, and this program was conceived on the back of a napkin with a little sketch as to how it would all work. And I, no, Stacy's asked me, have you ever found that napkin? I, I never did. But at that time, I met Jeff Mamber, who was uh, just starting up Nanorax LLC with a Space Act agreement with NASA to fly commercial or private payloads. And uh, SSEP was born. Um, this, this, uh, I, we were one of, I think, your first clients. Um, and so here we are, um, six years later, 65,000 students fully engaged in experiment design and proposal writing. Um, and this is very cool. Um, so I did this last time you were here. You were here last, I think, in 2014. Uh, can all of the um, student researchers stand up that are in the audience right now? This is what you made possible. And right now we've got 78 student researchers here for the conference split between two days. So this is who's in the auditorium or the audience right now. But I just wanted to say thanks, Jeff, for everything that Nanorex has done to make this program possible. So um, more officially, Jeff Member is the managing director of Nanorex LLC, a strategic partner for the Student Space Flight Experiments Program. OK, cool. Thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, it's a tradition now. I come in uh, every year off of vacation on the Eastern Shore, uh, and the only thing that could get me off of vacation from the Eastern Shore is Jeff and everything he's doing and you're doing, uh, students. It's just so inspiring for all of us. Uh, when we started Nanorax uh, six years ago, uh, we did not think education would be the first community to grab the idea of democratizing use of the space station, the idea that you didn't have to go through uh, a NASA space agency, put in a big proposal, uh, get some time. The idea of a commercial pathway, we thought would be primarily of interest to folks doing satellites and folks doing some uh, uh, on-orbit manufacture. And, and to find out that, that you know, education has been one of the, the most important things that we've done. It's just purely gratifying. And, uh, and I think you guys are gonna see the movie tonight, uh, the IMAX movie. It, when I saw that movie, it was such a reminder why we're in this crazy business, and being here today is also another reminder. Um, what I wanted to do very quickly, and, it's, and uh, we know, you know, we watch it and we help what you guys do, uh, at Nanorax, we take your payloads and we put it through the NASA process. Um, but there's other things out there that's really cool about the space station. And I thought I would just quickly tell you some of the things that uh, people are beginning to look at in using the space station. So I wanted to talk today about seven cool uh, things or reasons what you could do with the space station. So one of the uh, very cool things is that you were really pushing the envelope on what's happening with medical research. Uh, and this is not just to make the astronauts live better in space, but it's about here on Earth. It's about understanding certain medical equipment better, uh, certain processes, uh, interactions of fluids in the body. Uh, I, I've been surprised in the last few years to learn how much of the medical research is going to help us here in our hospitals on the Earth. So we're doing some very basic work on that. If you're gonna work with astronauts, that's, the, that's NASA. Na you know, the astronauts don't get touched by anybody else. But for, for understanding uh, fluid interactions, what's going on, you know, uh, DNA analysis, uh, we're now doing a fascinating project with Beijing Institute of Technology and looking at the effects of radiation and microgravity on DNA. And, they've get, and they're getting some interesting results in that. So one of the cool areas is just ex exploring more, to learn more about our bodies. And this, I, I mean, you know, who, who says more about this than Jeff, right? But it's so cool when you look out, you know, and you realize, you know, for me and for us at Nanorex, space station is so far away. 
And I hope that we're making it closer for people, you know, for you and in the work you're doing. But the space station is not far away. There's a whole universe out there. And the station is used as a test bed uh, and, a, and a research platform for this. And it's amazing it doesn't get more publicity. Um, but it's, it's some of the discoveries taking place on the space station, they have this hardware with investigators from all over the world. It's like 20 nations are participating. And uh, it's just as critical as the Hubble Space Telescope. It's maintained by the astronauts, and it's on the space station. I have nothing to do with it, but it's cool anyway, OK? It's, it's a really cool what the space station is used for. <clears throat> and I'll say something else. For a couple of years after the end of the space shuttle, folks in our industry, even at NASA, really thought of the space station as a long duration space shuttle. It would go up, you do something, you get, make sure it doesn't fail, you gotta be, and you go down. It's not that. It's part of our society, it's part of our, it's a home. And it now has permanent research facilities and you can tinker up there, you can send something up, bring it back down, fix it, send it back up again. So we're really beginning to think differently. This is not a platform going into space and returning. It's part of us that's in space. There's a lot of stuff that we're learning. There was just a very, very cool experiment. I don't know if you guys follow this. On the orbital rocket uh, Cygnus, uh, last week, I think it was, uh, I think it was last week, uh, a cargo ship went to the space station, unloaded its cargo, pulled away, and they lit a fire. And I cannot tell you how much safety and procedures were involved in allowing, even though the cargo ship was not at the space station, they lit a fire because a lot of what we, we know so little about a, microgravity, a lot of processes, and a lot of people for a long time have really wanted to study a fire in microgravity, but you don't want to study it on the space station. Let's figure out why, right? And, and there was a fire on the Mir, uh, the Russian space station. I think about, I'm gonna get it wrong, 99, I think it was, 1999. There was a fire and it was an accident. And they were surprised by the way the fire kind of went. And so this has been a long time in the making and they pulled it away. I haven't seen the results yet, but how cool is that? I mean, it's the kind of thing, you know, I have a six and a half year old and I know boys love fire and how cool is that to pull that, that, that platform away and light a fire. Also cool on is we deployed for the first time satellites as the cargo ship pulled away. Uh, that's another story, it was uh, uh, for both education and companies and we're always trying at Nanoracks to think of different ways to use the space station and, uh, and the rocket ships that go to it. So anyway, we're at the very beginning of understanding fire in microgravity. And you really can't think about going to Mars, which we're beginning to think about very seriously now, or returning to the moon, unless you understand basic processes like what happens if there's a fire. So that was a very cool experiment last uh, week, I think it was, and we'll wait to see uh, the results from that. Material science. For a long, long time, researchers, scientists, companies, universities have been fascinated by manufacturing crystals, pharmaceutical drugs, uh, glasses, the building blocks of so many things in zero gravity. And why is that? There's a couple of reasons. Let's take a look at just pharmaceutical drugs, you know, the drugs you get in the drugstore. There's about, they, they come from like, a very often from uh, uh, crystals, pharmaceutical crystals. And there's about 200 interesting crystals that we cannot replicate, grow, in laboratories here in 1G, in, in the Earth. And so we're hopeful that some of those will grow in space. And I said that for like 20, 30 years, we've been interested in this. Why is it going so slowly? Right? Slowly? Yeah, okay. Slowly. Okay, it's going slowly because before we only had the shuttle, and that was seven days, 10 days, sometimes maybe 14 days, not long enough to really grow these crystals. We had an experiment. We had five biofarm companies 
and they grew crystals uh, with us. And uh, we had one crystal grow that had never grown on the ground. That's big news. Okay, now what's gonna happen to that crystal? I don't know, it's commercial. And uh, hopefully they'll fly with us again and hopefully they'll, they'll keep pushing the, the envelope. There's a company uh, uh, in California that's now just beginning to do uh, uh, in-space manufacture of thin wafers, like semiconductors that are the building blocks of a lot of the circuit boards on computers. Again, this is something that we've been wanting to do for at least two decades, but we never had a, a, a space station. B, we never had transportation all the time to and from. And C, and this is a little pet peeve of mine, NASA's head wasn't in the right place. Before, if you did something with NASA, they would like take the research because the taxpayer paid for it. Well, here the taxpayer is not paying for the research. So if the taxpayer, with NanoRack, so if the taxpayer is not paying for the research, companies are willing to invest and they're willing to take time and effort. But they couldn't have done it on the shuttle really much. Uh, they tried sometimes, but a week is just too short a period of time. So another very cool area, and I think some of the research you guys are doing uh, comes into this area as well, studying the basics of, of uh, molecular structures, materials, and what you guys, and I just want to say, you know, I look at the list of what you guys are doing, and I only understand half of it, okay? I don't, at first when Jeff said, you know, we're gonna have kids of this age, and, kid, and I'm thinking oil and vinegar. You know, when I was growing up, they said oil and vinegar don't mix in a salad in space. You know, I, you know, I get that, okay? I look at what you guys are doing, it is so cool. I mean, if you invite me back, we should probably just, you know, have a slide that says, and the coolest thing is what all of you guys are doing. But the material science is an entirely, new area because of uh, the space station, because of the fact that we're commercial and uh, NASA lets us do it. NASA makes sure it's safe, but NASA does not share or take what we gain from that. So the last thing, this is kind of like one of the others, but again, we know very little about what really happens in space. And I don't know if you guys, follow, how closely you follow this, but you know Jeff Bezos, it's not Bezos, apparently, it's Bezos from Amazon. And uh, he has a space company. And uh, we're very lucky at Nanorax. Uh, uh, his company's chosen us to be a partner and we're working with them. And um, right now they have a suborbital rocket uh, spaceship called New Shepard. It doesn't go to space, it just goes up. And I think in five years, Blue Origin will be going to space, completely commercial. But the reason I raise it is that about two weeks ago, Jeff Bezos said, one of the reasons why, he, uh, it's rumored he has spent $500 million. So every time you guys get Legos or whatever stuff, you're, you're contributing to uh, Jeff Bezos and his dream of going to space. And uh, he, has, he said about two weeks ago that one of the reasons he's doing this is he wants to, in the future, have all the polluting factories, all the factories that make stuff that really pollutes us here on Earth, he wants to have those factories in space. And you know, everybody in the industry was like, wow, we've been working in this industry for a long time and we've never quite had the nerve to say something like that. But if we're gonna realize that kind of dream to move, to make the earth a cleaner place and take some of the factories and move them into space, we have to understand this. Okay, fluids are the basic, I mean, we understand so little. And if we're going to start to have fires and we're gonna to start to manufacture stuff and we're gonna to wanna to start to cool things down and we're gonna have refrigerants, we know very little today. If there's, a, you know, at your age, there is not a better industry where you can contribute and change the way life is here on Earth, never mind going out into space because there's so little things, so, there's so little, there's so much we have to learn. I mean, how many more apps can we develop, okay? You guys are doing all the apps, and then, but we need your help here in understanding the future, fluids, what's happening with crystals and, and, and the way things flow. We can't have factories in space unless we understand this. So um, one, I think this is the last one, 
And I mean, this stuff is so cool to me. I mean, time. I mean, time is a relative thing, as Einstein said, okay? And we are still pushing the boundaries on, on, under, on measuring time. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, you, you know, I, Jeff asked me to be here at 1225. Okay, I'm here at 1225. Was I really here at 1225? Well, you know, it, the, these sort of clocks for a lot of industrial things, for a lot of sophisticated computers, not for me arriving on time and Jeff not going, getting nervous, I'm, I'm not gonna find a parking space, but uh, we really need uh, to understand better uh, time, its relationship and the gra gravitational forces, as Einstein said, and we're beginning to do that in space. And one of the most extraordinary things and coolest things is every few years we have another uh, in space, uh, okay, in space demonstration to see if Albert Einstein was correct. And son of a gun, every time we do one of these tests, he's correct. I mean, how extraordinary is that? He was coming up with these ideas in the 1920s, the 1930s, uh, 19, I think maybe up till the maybe 20s and 30s. And, the th and we are spending all of this effort to understand if he was correct, and so far it seems he was correct. And since it seems he was correct, and the relationship between time and gravity and all of these forces, you know, E equals MC squared, one of the ways we're understanding that is in space, and in the next few years, the space station will be part of that as well. So I think that's my list of seven of the coolest things that are going on uh, on the space station and in space. Uh, at Nanorax, you know, we have customers now in 15 countries. Uh, we are doing everything we can to support programs like yours. And I just want to conclude by saying, you know, we have now, you know, a whole bunch of customers, luckily. Nobody, and I think you all agree with me, nobody works harder than Jeff Goldstein. Uh, he cares about you, he believes in you, and we're really delighted to be working with all of you and Jeff. So thank you very much. Anybody got any questions about anything, about space? Hi, I'm Michael from Houston. Hey. Uh, I love these ideas, uh, especially everything that has to do with the new experimentations and upcoming technology. To that avail, is there some kind of uh, idea towards the future for this experiment program of ours to allow for more flexibility, say inside, outside the spaceship, radiation testing, those kinds of things? Well, you know, it's up to, it's up to you guys, of course. Um, the first few, the, the general way to answer that is in the first few years of student payloads, uh, NASA was very, very cautious. First, there was a philosophical thing, wait, the astronauts are the most important. Uh, until Jeff came along, 95, 99% of educational programs didn't allow students to have hardware going up on the space station. So NASA had to get its head in the right place that the astronauts should be doing this. Uh, why aren't you working just in our programs where you don't get a chance to, to really go to space? So it's kind of my way of saying, I think they're relaxing now. They're seeing the value of it. They're seeing the, the cool stuff you, you guys are doing. Uh, I, again, I think we all thought it would be oil and vinegar, you know, doesn't mix in space. So I think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, uh, they're getting much more comfortable uh, allowing us to do new things. One other thing to say is we're entering a new era now. And I think in the next few years, you're going to see some serious proposals to have commercial platforms. That's what we call it in the industry, little space stations, where NASA is not directly in charge. And uh, Mike Safradini, the former head of Space Station, who helped when he was at NASA get your program going, has announced he wants to do his own station. Nanorax is looking at our own station. So there may be more flexibility in the future. Yeah, cool. Thanks for the question. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.